You can't really develop a team without good players on the field because it takes time to make a player. Two sorts of players to be good players and just good players. You've got these great players who've got the ability to make other people play well. We want players who want to be not players. They want to wear the club badge, they want to become proud, they want to make a career here and become part of like some of the players that have gone in the past. Pete, we're going to take some time to talk about how you go about building and nurturing a squad. You've won trophies at three different counties. What's the initial process of uh, recruitment selection when you arrive at a new club? I think the first thing you do, you see what you've got, I think, and you give everybody a fair chance to see um, what they've got and how they settle into what will be a new, a new way, probably. doesn't mean you'll build on the past. So, I mean, my theory has always been the same wherever I've gone to. You try and build on what was there. Uh, don't try and re restart something off. I mean, when I came to the club here, Mick had got some great foundation, we've got to build on that, but things have got to move forward, always have. So you give every player the proper chance and then you see where things go. I mean, what happened here was an interesting one in that we had quite a lot of natural retirements of people who just got to a certain point. And then once you know what you've got, you've got two ways to go really, either going to pull through your own system, there's going to be holes, you're going to have to plug those holes and you're going to try and recruit from the outside. Every team will have strengths and weaknesses. When you looked about the recruiting process for 2020, how much did you feel you had to bring in from outside and how much improvement do you feel there could be from within? Well, when you bring often through your own system um, to bring, we've lost quite a lot of players on the staff. So over the last 18, probably 24 months, we've lost a huge amount of players, much more than you normally would. Uh, and that's through various reasons. Um, I say retirements to people like your, you know, your Chris Reeds, your, your Michael Lums, people like Brendan Taylor going back to Zimbabwe. We've been through this sort of red-white ball phase where we've had players like Alex Hales and Harry Gurney retire now from, from red ball cricket. And then we've lost some players frustratingly, I think. You know, someone like Luke Wood going to Lancashire was really frustrating for us. We wanted him to stay, but you can't dictate where a player's going to play his cricket. And we've been through this transition. So the first thing we did, really, we, we looked at our own sort of academy, what's coming through, and what opportunities can we create in there. And because of that, we signed um, three or four youngsters on the staff. We also knew within our own staff, we had some players we signed from the academy before, Jack Blatherwick, Tom Moores, um, Matt Carter, who we started to create opportunities for. And we had a group of senior players left over. You know, your, your Steve Mullaney as captain, your Jake Balls, your Luke Fletchers. You know, that, that, that crew of seniority. But we knew we were light. Um, and you can't really develop a team without good players on the field because it takes time to make a player. So we looked to recruit, if we could, some seniority. Um, I think points are different type of players, what we're looking for. Generally, our success in white ball cricket especially is based around getting players who can win a game uh, and try and put them together in a team framework so you can win from lots of different angles. Um, so that's what we looked at and then you can only go with what's out there. So the part of it, you, you're limited. It's not like uh, picking an international team where you can say, well, okay, here's the country. Who do I really fancy will go with that? You go with who's available, who wants to move and who might want to sign for you. We see uh, an increasing trend towards specialisms within county squads. Um, Hasiba Mead is one of those players with a, a Red Bull focus in mind when you captured his signature. You know the player extremely well. Um, what do you hope to get from him during his Nottinghamshire career? Well, I hope to get the best of his career, is what I hope. Um, I saw him growing up at Lancashire, sort of from being about a sort of 15-year-old. Exceptional talent, um, very focused lad, really wants to be successful. And because of that, I think, really came through fast. You know, played for England and showed straight away when he played for England, he had the temperament for international cricket. You know, he had this, this ability to uh, stay calm under pressure against someone like India, you know. Because that first bit, when any young player plays international sport or even first class sport, the first thing you've got to deal with is you play against your sort of heroes start with. So that would have happened to Asbury, handle it really well. He then went into a real dip. Now that dip happens for most sportsmen. They go through this sort of this rise and then there's a, there's a bit of a crash. Um, his lasted a bit longer than he would have liked. He's, you know, he's gone for a couple of years uh, and he needed a change of scene. So when he became available, um, I was keen because he's one Red Bull focused, which is where we need to strengthen. Two, um, very passionate about that form of the game and wants to back time. And that's an area we've really struggled with last year. And he's young. He's at an age now where he's ready to, I think, to move into that next phase of a career where you find your method, your style, 
and you get a consistent player. We're looking for, you know, he's 23 now, 22, 23. The next couple of years, him to become that sort of player that then will have his full career here. And people look back, they'll see him really, hopefully as a notch player, someone who's been part of a new team and a new setup. What do you feel you need to add to him for him to, to fulfil that potential that is undoubtedly there? You look at the, um, the highlights of uh, what is a very, very um, young career. It didn't quite work out towards the end at Lanks, but what, what value do you personally hope to add to his game? To try and help him not overthink, I think. He, he's a good enough player now. Um, he, I think he's clear what he wants. Uh, the danger with striving for something all the time is you tend to want to all the time add a bit of something. If anything, we're trying to say, well, listen, you, you've got enough here. Just let's keep this really simple. Um, do your work, do your practice, and you, basically you're going to look out there, watch the ball and play, because you, you're a good enough player. And that's what he, where, where he would have started. Most players have got to go through some sort of search to find their game. I think he's got a game. I think he just needs to know how to get out there and prove to himself, as much as anybody else, that he can get that consistency. If he does, then he's going to have a fine career. Tom Barber is another player that you'll hope to um, add some, some value to. What, what strengths does he bring to the squad? What Tom's got, he's got pace. Now, what he's lacked in the past, he's had a lot of injuries, he's lacked consistency, really, to be able to do it. His best ball is a really good ball. He's got to put more of them together. Now, what, Tom, what we can give Tom is opportunity. So one of the things that's lovely as a coach, if, the, if, there's, a, if there's a space there, you can say to somebody, listen, you can have a go. There's no guarantees with it. Tom knows that, I know that, we all know that in sport. But he's got his chance. If he gets it right, he's one of those players who's very exciting, hence why he was identified on a pace programme as a young man. And again, he's gone through one of those sort of more through his body. Uh, pace bowling's hard work um, and young bodies don't like it. Some are unlucky. He was unlucky, stress fractures and other injuries that have kept him off the field more than he would like. He'll spend a lot of time under the tutelage of, of Kevin Shine, um, himself spent a lot of time involved in that. Um, pace programme with, with England. How does Kevin go about his day-to-day -day business and what's the reaction been amongst the, the not seam attack? Yeah, Kev's been a, he's been a great signing for us, I think. You know, you, sometimes you sign a great player, sometimes you can sign yourself a great coach and, and Kevin's come on board and I know I know Shiny from, from a long way back, playing against him and also being with him on the academy. He's now a very experienced coach. He's been around a long time, 20 years doing the job. So he's seen a lot. His knowledge base is be probably second to anybody in the world, I would think, of what he's researched and what he's seen. But with that has come an ability to simplify things. And that's the most important thing for the young Seaver. I think you'll know straight away if you work with Kevin, you'll know he's passionate about it. He'll care about you and he'll do everything he can to get you better. The question is, can he help you simplify in your own head what it is you need to do? And I think what he's done for Tom along with a lot of the other bowlers, is I help him identify the key areas he's got to try and step over if he's going to become a consistent performer. Because ideally, well, essentially really, you know, he's going to play out here. He's going to play at Trent Bridge. Now, the first time he plays here in front of the members, he's going to want to impress. He's going to be under pressure. He's going to feel that tension. He's going to have to deal with that. Uh, and that's what you prepare for. And that excitement that I've done the work, I can go out and play. Now, I think Shiny's as good as anybody I've seen at that. Giving players simple cues that they can go to, so under pressure they've got a chance to go and deliver. Young players need to be surrounded by more experienced professionals with, with real leadership qualities. Does Peter Trigo fit that bill? Yeah, I mean, Pete, Pete was a really um, interesting signing for us, I think, in that Pete became available. I think Summer was quite surprised that Summer said maybe let him go. Very experienced bloke, been around the game for 20 years. Um, fantastic professional uh, because competitor, um, loves the battle, uh, works extremely hard his game, one of the fittest guys on the circuit, I think. So he fit a lot of things for us, but what we wanted, we wanted two things. We wanted his ability to help move other people forward, um, but we wanted him as a competitive player. So when things happen on the field or in training, sometimes you need that senior man to be able to say, you know, sort of well done, fantastic, keep going, son. Or sometimes, come on, you've got more in you than that, and you push it out, and that's not really, the coach is sat up there. The players actually out there, with the, the senior players out there, his responsibility is to help with the captain keep that side working and focus on what it's got to do. What about the, the ones that got away? How frustrating is that process when you've drawn up a shortlist, the offers are out there, and occasionally you don't land a player you want? How do you equip yourself to deal with that? Yeah, I mean, you pitch for your player like anybody a pitch of a business, I suppose, sometimes. You need, it has to be the right time. If you miss out a player, you really fancied. Yeah, it's disappointing in the short term, but I would say to any player, every time I sit with a player, 
I'm always saying the same thing. They've got to make the decision that they think is right for them. Uh, we make our play because they've got to want to come somewhere. We, you know, we want players who want to be not players. They want to wear the club badge. They want to become proud. They want to make a career here and become part of, like some of the players that have gone in the past. You know, the recent past. You know, the names of Reed, Hussey. Adams, those people that will become part of folklore of the club, that's what you want players to come for. And the game's changed so much, you know, with now franchise cricket and other things. You're trying to select carefully people who want to be part of that. And that, especially when you recruit from the outside, um, you're looking for that hunger in them. If you miss out on them, um, it's time to move on, I think. You know, you did your best to try and get them. And there's no guarantees. We've been for two or three players. That hasn't happened, which is fair enough. And then when they go on somewhere else, you wish them well. Squad building obviously takes time. You were quite successful um, in identifying and bringing some um, pretty big hitting targets to the club in, in 2019. You spoke about the high ceiling that the likes of Ben Duckett and, and Joe Clark have. What's your view of those guys having seen them at close quarters for a, for a year and have seen the, the qualities that they bring to Trent Bridge? Yeah, it's been really interesting watching because in la last year was maybe came like a perfect storm. The lads came with big reputations. They played a lot of second division cricket without playing a lot of first division cricket. They're certainly very good players, hence why they've been on Lions trips and done well and, and whatever. And then we came here, we've had the first game played Yorkshire, did really well, and the expectation went sort of through the roof. Um, and the first division's a tough division. And for various reasons, you know, two or three of those, Benny Slate not dissimilar, got themselves out of form and out of confidence. Expectation of the club was, was high, we weren't playing well, and they got themselves under real pressure. So this winter was really a case of them looking back and saying, OK, what, what do we need, what do I need to do? Not so much we, what do I need to do as a, as a player to get myself in the best possible place to play well this season? And there was various things. Um, some things were squad things, uh, physical fitness and hard work we wanted to do as a group, fielding. Some were individual, they might be slightly technical or methods. What I would say about all those players, um, they've been really tough on themselves in some ways, but they've really gone about their work. They work extremely hard. They've all changed in various different ways. I think to adapt to a different club, um, a different standard that's now set by them, what expectation, expectation of this club is high quite rightly so and they, they're desperate to get out there and show what they've got uh, and the key for me for them will be to trust what they've done uh, be patient um, because they've done the work and then the talent hopefully will start to come through the second bit i think that will help is we now know them better they know us better and that that trust thing you need to be uh, a good setup you know any culture really it's built, it's built, it's first base is about, you know, we trust each other, we're fair, we're straight. There's nothing else going on here. We work hard, we go and try and play for the members, for the club, for the office staff, for ourselves, for everybody. And we just get about our business. Now we've had a winter working together, so I think all those players will feel much more settled now, um, as we do with them. And that's been part of the winter, it's trying to build that unit together really, so everybody starts to feel part of a team. What's the best signing you ever made, Pete? Oh, good question. Um, I think statistically, I have to be probably Mushy, Mushtakama at Sussex. Um, when we signed him, he was uh, he played a couple of games for Surrey, and did, he played against Sussex actually. He didn't get a wicket, I don't think, in the game. He'd, he'd had a really interesting time of it. I remember going for lunch with him and chatting to him um, and saying, you know, and I was quite challenging. I was saying, you know, give me the reason why you think we should sign you as a player. And he said two or three things there that absolutely landed with me. One was um, he just wanted to play because he loved the game. And it would taken him a long time to realise how much he loved the game. Um, but he does. And he said, if any time you see me not enjoying it or working hard, please just come and kind of tell me. The second one was he said, um, I think I'm going to get 100 wickets and we're going to win the championship. Of which uh, I went, right, OK. Um, I've seen it, you know, he's found, he found religion in many ways, he, he'd really changed a lot in his life. He got 103 wickets and we won the championship. And it, it was a bit like, it was like signing, um, I don't know, Harry Kane or a top flight striker. Suddenly we got this guy on and we, we were a hard working side, we were a good team. So like James Kirtley had, had a fantastic first half of that season, which is forgotten sometimes, played for England. A lot of young players had come through, um, probably Martin Jenkins and people like that had come through the ranks. 
but Mushy was like the he was like your your cream of the crop. He, not only did he play well out there, he had this lovely ability to motivate and, and get people going off the field and within the team unit. I was a young coach, he was good for me as a coach, very international, a lot of international experience. So yeah, all round package, mushy I think. We talk about um, players like Dan Christian that add a lot to the environment when they're in it for a short space of time. Um, David Hussey, sorry for it not, uh, mushy in your, in your Sussex side. What effect can it have on the side when someone comes in from the outside and, and lights the world on fire? Well, these top international players, there's sort of two sorts of players to be. Good players are just good players. You've got these great players who've got the ability to make other people play well. Um, Dan has been a really interesting one for us here. Dan came in, he hadn't captained anywhere. And then suddenly he started captaining for us. The bloke was a natural leader anyway because he did it with or without the captain's badge. But those people who normally people play well around very good international players because this, the player has the ability to see the ability that's in that player and they back him. They back them through, you know, you know, through hell and high water in some ways. They've also got to have a fantastic enthusiasm for the game still. You know, if somebody comes to a club and they're doing lip service to it, they're just they're waiting for another international gig or something bigger and better, everybody knows. Uh, Jimmy Pattinson, who worked out here in 2017, I remember we played at Durham and Jimmy had bowled, he'd got runs and he bowled fast early in the season. And I was walking around to go behind the arm and a member stopped me and said, can I just say something? Um, can you go back and when you see Mr. Pattinson, can you tell him? That sort of commitment I've not seen from an overseas player since David Hussey pulled on a, a trem till pulled on a not shirt, and I absolutely love it. And can you tell him thank you? So I went back and told him. Um, and that sort of thing, that's gold dust.